to Psalm 119. 119. Uh, we read a little bit of it earlier in that song that Aaron had uh, written, and I'm going to read from Psalm 119, verses 7 to 16, one of the longest chapters in all of Scripture, and we're going to read nine verses together this morning. Are you ready to study God's Word together this morning, church? Hmm, come on now. Here we go. I love Psalm 119. I love these verses. If you are somebody who is struggling Right? I want to talk to the Christians for a, a moment. If you are here or you're watching live online and you are struggling as a Christian, you keep failing. You need to read Psalm 119. The psalmist is writing about how they continue to fail and they struggle. And the thing that helps them is understanding God's word. And so this morning, in these two weeks, next week, Pastor Luke Edgerton is going to be kind of student takeover week. He's going to be here sharing why he loves the Bible. And in Psalm 119, this is what it says. I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. How can those who are young, any young people in the room are watching online, how can those who are young keep their way pure? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. Praise be to you, Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips, I recount all the laws that came from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. I want to tell you this, in our culture today, where as a Christian, it's easy to say verbally that we love Jesus, it's another thing to actually believe the things that he taught. And so for me as a Christian, I want to tell you, I didn't go to a Christian college. I didn't grow up a super spiritual guy. Rob didn't either. He's going to share a little bit about that this morning. But the one thing I've found over the last decade is the more I actually base my life off of Scripture rather than basing Scripture off my life, you know the difference? The more I base my life off of Scripture, the more I see God show up in my life. I believe it to be true, and that's a little bit at the heart of what this morning is about. Will you bow your heads in prayer with me? Lord Jesus, we just thank you for this morning. I thank you for all these amazing people from all different spiritual backgrounds that are here with us or watching online. And we just ask, Lord Jesus, that you connect with us. We acknowledge the presence of, of your Holy Spirit here in the room with us right now. And we ask, God, that you encourage us this morning, you convict us where we need convicted, and we might turn to you, Lord Jesus. We pray this in your name and all God's family said. Amen. Will you guys welcome Rob as he comes up and shares a little bit? Thanks. So... I am so excited to be at church this morning. How many of you guys are excited to be at church this morning? Let me hear you. That's good. That's pretty good. I like that. I love going to church. I talk to my wife about it all the time. This is my favorite day of the week. It really, truly is. And I, and I, I just love being here. I love being a part of this church. This church has been an amazing church to be a part of. I met Josh six years ago. Uh, my wife and I had moved to Indianapolis uh, to plant a church, and Josh and his family had moved to Indianapolis to plant a church. And so we connected instantly, and I was in a season of waiting. And I don't know if you've ever been in a season of waiting, but it's like, man, you're just, you're ready to go, but, you know, you're kind of being held back a little bit. It can be a little bit, you know, like, come on, let's get in the game. And so we prayed about it, and God really spoke to us to get involved with Mercy Road and to help them and to learn from them and to see what it's like playing a church. And it has been an awesome ride seeing, you know, what God is doing in this church and through the leaders of this church. And I just want to give you guys a big hand and just say, man, I am just so thankful for what God is doing in your guys' life. And I love to hear those stories. I love being at church. The other thing is I love being a Christian. I mean, I really, really love it. I think being a Christian is one of the most amazing things that you can do in your life is to become a Christian. You know, think about this. The God of all creation, the guy who created you, the guy who cre created me, the God who created all the animals, the light, the darkness, everything, we get to have relationship with that God. How incredible is that really? To me, I believe that if you do this thing right, if you do it right, Christianity is the most exciting life that you will ever live. 
if you do it right. Think about this, the Bible. You look in the Bible, you got a guy like Moses, okay? Moses is called by God to set the children of Israel free from Egypt. They've been oppressed for all these years. And how does God speak to him? Through a bush. A bush. A plant. He speaks to, to, to Moses out of a plant. Not just any plant, but a plant that is on fire. Like a burning plant is speaking to Moses. How incredible is that? And, and the plant, it doesn't burn to the ground. No, it's not like normal things that are on fire. It just remains intact. I mean, God does incredible things. And if you do it right, God will do something incredible through your life. I love the next step. So you think everything gets easy after he gets called? No way. He goes to Pharaoh. He's like, hey, I got to take these people. We're heading out. Pharaoh says, no way. I don't think so. It gets more difficult. But God comes through. He gets Pharaoh's attention. He starts sending plagues with frogs and darkness and, and animals start dying and all these things start to happen. And God gets his attention and Pharaoh's like, okay, I'm with you. You guys go ahead and go. So then life gets easy for Moses and the children of Israel, right? No, it gets worse because now they're fleeing and the Egyptians are chasing them and they have a change of heart and they want them back. They get all the way to the Red Sea and they're pinned in with their oppressors chasing them down. And what happens? God provides. God provides. He splits the sea with a wall on one side, a wall on the other. They go through on dry land. And as soon as they reach the other side with the Egyptians coming behind them, God collapses the sea, washes away the enemy, and then he sends them on their journey to the promised land. How awesome is that? The God that we serve is amazing. I love being a Christian, and I love the Bible. I love reading what God has done in the past, and I love reading his word, and I love reading what God is saying to all of creation. I love the Bible. Today, my, my hope is that each one of us would grow hungrier for the word of God, and that we would take time to develop relationship with him through the word of God. There is an attack today on the Bible in our culture. There's an absolute attack. This culture wants to totally make the Bible an outdated, irrelevant book. They say, you know, it's a sacred book, but it's not really scientific. You can't trust the things that happen in the Bible. It's, it's not really scientific. It's a historical book. Sure, there, a lot of those things did happen in the past. They took, they took account of it. It's historical, but it's not relevant to your life today. I'm here to tell you today, the Bible is so relevant to our lives. We're going to talk more about that. And then they also will say, it's, yeah, it's inspirational. You can get a lot of good quotes out of the Bible, but it's not necessarily all true. There is a huge attack on the Bible today, and we have to stand in that fight to trust the Word of God and its accuracy. Josh is going to be talking some about that as well. Today, I want to tell you a story about my first experience with the Bible. My first experience. I remember it very, very clearly. My dad had found out from some of my friends, or he had heard from some of my friends, that I had been messing with this stray cat in the neighborhood, and I had hurt the cat. These friends had told on me and had said that. Thing was, is I didn't really do it. I never, I, I didn't do it at all. And so my dad came to me, and he's like, he's like, Rob, he's like, he's like, why are you doing this? I said, I didn't do that. He's like, tell me the truth, because I've had multiple friends come and tell me this. These were a couple guys in the neighborhood. And I'm like, no, dad, I didn't do it. And so my very first experience was the Bible. My dad pulled out his mother's Bible. It was locked in a, in a cabinet. This is it right here. This is what it looked like. He pulled this Bible out. He said, Rob, I'm going to find out today if you're telling the truth or not. I want you to put your hand on my mother's Bible. And I want you to swear to me that you're telling me the truth right now. And if you're, if you're not telling the truth, you're going to go to hell. <laughs> that was my first experience with the Bible. Too. Yeah, I, yeah, that's how I parent my children as well. I learned everything from my father. No, I do not recommend that, man. I was like afraid for my eternal security at age six. So um, it probably plays into my desire to please God, but... Uh, but yeah, that was my first experience with the Bible. I don't know what your experience has been with the Bible. You know, maybe your experience has been that uh, your, your family 
got together and it was this loving book where you read and you prayed together and you grew up in a Christian home, that was not my life. You know, maybe, maybe for you, you grew up and it was a book that was on a shelf, right? And it just sat there and, you know, collected a little bit of dust, but you, you never saw anybody open that. Never. Or maybe your experience with, with the Bible was that you were taught to doubt it. You know, that it's not true, that the things that are written in there, they were just made up by people who were trying to get people to conform, to, to act a certain way. Whatever your experience was with the Bible, today, I believe that we're going to have an incredible opportunity to trust the reliability of the Bible and to also have a relationship with God through it. Thanks, man. That's great. Is this Bible from like the 1800s? I'm afraid yes. it's going to like fall apart as I stand up here and preach. It looks awesome, man. I love the history of that, except the evil thing your dad did. Uh, the second thing I want to share with you, I love the Bible because it's reliable. Uh, and what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share this stuff, uh, and some of you, you left-brainers, you're going to nerd out for a second. You're going to love this stuff. And the, and the other of you that are like super creative, you're going to like not like any of this. It's okay. Just get through it. Here, here's what I want to share with you. If you're unfamiliar with the Bible... The, the Old Testament and the New Testament were written during different time periods. The Old Testament, uh, we hold to be the Hebrew Scriptures. There are 39 books that got into the canon. Uh, canon means a collection of literary books. You can have a canon of literature in any different genre. In this case, we're talking about the canon of Scripture. And it's written in ancient Hebrew. I actually have a Hebrew Bible up here. If anybody afterwards wants to come and check it out, you read it right to left. It's really weird, and you probably can't read anything in it. But 39 books in the Old Testament that got in, 27 books in the New Testament that got in. How do we get today's Bible, and is it reliable? Because I'm going to tell you right now, if you were in high school, and you're going to go off to college soon, you're going to have a professor, and they're going to bring up that we don't have any of the original manuscripts of the Bible. So how do we know it to be true, and how in the world could you trust it with your life if we don't even have the original manuscripts? Anybody ever heard that before? I want to tell you, first of all, as a Christian, I believe that Jesus came to bring grace and truth, and so we need to be very truthful. There are no original manuscripts of the Bible. We don't have the Gospel of John that John actually penned down onto parchment. We don't have it. Uh, but we don't have any original manuscripts of any book written during that time period in any part of the world. The only thing, the, one of the most ancient documents that we do have is they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in 1945. They were kept in clay jars and caves in the middle of the desert that were written before the time of Jesus, and they literally, word for word, matched up to what the, uh, the version of the Old Testament that we hold today. And I believe that both the Old Testament and I'm going to focus more of our time on the New Testament are the most historically reliable documents we have from that time period by far. By far. I mean, it's not even close. It's not. And I'm like, I, I am a doubter. I am somebody that um, I don't trust things easily. And I want to tell you, it's not even close. See, here's the thing. The how we decided what got into the New Testament in particular and the Old Testament, it started around 325 AD at the Council of Nicaea. All the Christians that day, they got together and said, hey, we got to make some major decisions. This wasn't the controversial thing that occurred there, although there was some debating. The more controversial thing was Jesus fully God and Arius, this uh, person who became a heretic, did not believe that to be true. And so at the Council of Nicaea, they decided these major things. Um, contrary to a book by Dan Brown, this was called together by many of the Christians, uh, leaders of the five different regional churches at that time. And here's what they decided. In the New Testament, they chose books that had the closest to, the authors had closeness to Jesus. In other words, they were one of the original disciples or had followed along closely with them, or was the Apostle Paul who became the leader of much of the early writings of the early church. And so they also looked at which ones were dated and written earlier. 
Because if you wrote a gospel and it was written in the second century AD and Jesus was crucified on the cross around 30 or 33 AD, that's not really possible that anybody was still alive who could contradict what you had written hundreds of years later. You agree with that? So what they decided was things had to be written within a time period where people could debate it. And so you hear sometimes of these lost gospels. Anybody ever seen a report on the TV about the gospel of Judas or the gospel of Thomas or these other lost gospels? Those are actual writings that really exist. I encourage you, you can read them. They're great things to kind of get an understanding of the culture during that time period. But they were written by Gnostics. Not Christians, Gnostics. And we don't have time to go into uh, historicity of what Gnosticism is, but it was essentially a philosophy, kind of a New Age philosophy in the second century AD, much after the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And so the Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of Peter and the Gospel of Judas and these lost Gospels were written not by Christians, but by Knox as much later. In fact, you don't need to read much other than if you read the Gospel of Thomas, there's a story in there about Jesus as a little kid. He wants to impress his friends, so he throws rocks and he kills these birds. And then he feels guilty about what he did to the birds, and so then he resurrects the birds from the dead. That's in the Gospel of Thomas. Those Gospels, you don't have to read much of them to understand why they didn't get into the Scripture. They were written much later by Gnostics and don't hold to what the the truth of the early Christians knew to be true because they were alive during the time. F.F. Bruce writes this, there are many theological questions arising out of the history of the canon which we cannot go into here. But for a practical demonstration that the church made the right choice, one need only compare the books of our New Testament with the various early documents collected to realize the superiority of our New Testament books to these others. And what he means is this. We have many, many, many ancient, old manuscripts of the Bible, much older than most of the books written in that time period because they were very adamant about writing things down and preserving them because it was the Bible. We have over, and this is the conservative number, we have over 5,000 Greek manuscripts for within the first few centuries of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Some of them were written on papyrus. I share this with you because papyrus was like ancient paper. It did not preserve well. That's why it was incredible that the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. They were written on papyrus, and the only reason they were preserved because they were in clay jars in a cool cave in the desert where it was preserved for a millennia. It's incredible. Uh, But in the 300s, they began to write things down on vellum. Vellum was not ancient paper. Vellum was, anybody remember like school where you had like the vellum you put on the, uh, what do you call that where you see the screen up there? I don't even remember, it's so ancient. Projector, is that what it's called? I don't remember. Some of you are older than me and you probably remember better. That was a joke. But so you would project it up. That was on vellum. Vellum in the ancient days was like animal skin, and it preserved much better. And so we have complete, complete works of the New Testament from within the early 4th century A.D. From with 300 years from the time of Jesus, we have complete um, accounts of it. The most famous ones are the Codex Vaticanus. Anybody know where that's kept? At the Vatican, Codex Vaticanus, the Codex City Iticus is actually written even earlier than that, around 350 AD, and it's kept parts of it around the world, but some of it is at the British Museum in London, along with Codex Alexandrinus, which is also kept at the British Museum in London. We have complete works of the New Testament on vellum, and we also have many scraps of papyrus written within the first hundred years of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. One of the oldest is from John 18, around 125 AD. It's called Rylands. I got a picture. That's actually Codex Sinaiticus right there, a piece of it. That was vellum. This is papyrus. You can kind of see the difference there. And that uh, we have all kinds of scraps. This one of the earliest from around 125 AD, and that's actually John 18. So if you've ever heard somebody say, hey, I only read the King James Version. It's the only version of the Bible that's real, and you shouldn't read any others. It's because they don't understand how the Bible is compiled together. Uh, the King James Version is taken from a later vellum writing that the king had when it 
uh, came time to write their own Bible in uh, the, the Renaissance period. But the Bible that we have takes all the best manuscripts and scraps of papyrus, and they determine what was actually written on it. Now, to give you an idea why this is so much more historical than other writings of that time, Caesar's Gaelic War from around 50 BC, the oldest copy we have of it is from 900 years after the time of Caesar. 900 years. We have complete works within 300 years of the time of Jesus. Of the 142 books of Roman history of Livy, written uh, somewhere between 59 BC and uh, 17 AD, only 35 books left, and the oldest copy of one book is incomplete and dates to the 4th century AD. Of the 14 books of Tacitus histories, four and a half survive, and the oldest copy dates from the 9th century the ninth century. Of the history of Thucydides and the history of Herodotus, the earliest manuscript we have is from 900 AD, and the earliest papyrus scraps are from the first century. Yet no historian would debate the validity of any of those works. And of the Bible, we have way more ancient, full uh, manuscripts written on vellum and much earlier pieces of papyrus that have determined what is actually, I believe it to be the most historically accurate book of the time period. F.F. Bruce writes this, yet no classical scholar would listen to an argument that the authenticity of Herodotus or Thucydides is in doubt because the earliest manuscript of their works, which are of any use to us, or over 1,300 years later than the originals. Rob's gonna uh, come back up now and share for a little while. Dude, that's killer, man. That is some heavy stuff, but it's good. I, I think it's incredible to learn the history of how the Bible came together and how reliable it is because it makes me, it builds my confidence in the faith Uh, that God is actually put together that Bible and that it's actually from him. I want to talk about why we should read the Bible. So if we're going to read it, we should have some good reasons of of what we're trying to learn there. And the first reason, and the scriptures are going to be up here as well, but the first reason that I have is because the Bible reveals God's character. Okay, We can learn who God is by reading his word. This word has been passed down generationally till till today, and we can trust that the things that are in that Bible are completely accurate. We can learn that he's loving, that he's kind, that he has joy, that sometimes he's mad, sometimes he's sad. You can learn about God's character and who he is and how we can pattern our life after his character to be like him. Second, the Bible reveals God's purposes. Reveals God's purposes. God has a purpose for your life, my life, for this church, for the church around the world, and what he's doing in the world. God has a purpose, and you can learn about that through the Bible. I love Romans chapter 12, verse 2. It says, do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We can renew our mind by reading the Bible and learning what he has for our life so that we may know what the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God is. So we learn, so we read it because we want to know what God's purposes are. And third, we want to read it because we want to know what God's promises are. See, if we know what God's promises are, then we know how to pray because we know what God is all about. We know what he cares about. We know what he said. We know that what he's willing to do. We need to know what his promises are. I was thinking about the, the verse that talks about how God will never leave us or forsake us when uh, Aaron was up here singing that song and he was talking about, you know, hey, sometimes we have lonely times in our life. And I just I just want to speak that to somebody today who's in this room that, you know, God will never leave you and forsake you. He will never leave you and forsake you. And if you feel that way, God has a word for you today. He wants to share that with you. And you can learn about those promises in the Bible. So we read to learn God's character, purposes, and also his promises. So how do we do it? What are we going to do about it today? Today, the challenge is, let's start to read the Bible regularly. And I know what the pushback is. Man, I have tried to read the Bible. I have tried. And it's just, you know, it's hard to read. It's, you know, it confuses me sometimes. Or, you know, I've got, I get busy. You don't know all the things that I do, Rob. Like, you know, we've got soccer. We've got work. We've got all these things going on in our life. But I can tell you that there is no greater way 
to live your life than to jump into God's word and to begin to spend time with him. And today, this is how I'm going to ask you to do it. Instead of looking at it as this huge challenge where you're going to spend 10 chapters every single day reading the Bible or that you're going to spend, you know, an hour every single day reading the Bible, this is what I want to challenge you to do. One verse every single day. Read one verse every single day. And the reason why I ask you to read one verse is because at least if you stop and slow down and will open God's word and take a look at it and spend some time reading one verse, at least you've started. You know, you don't have to, you don't have, to have this reading plan where you get done with the entire Bible in, in three months. You can just take it one verse at a time. And then if you're hungry and you're like, God, I, I, I have more time, you know, you can dive in and you can read for as long as you want to. But just challenge yourself this morning to read one verse. One of the other things that I, encourage, that I would encourage you to think about is be creative about the way that you read. You know, maybe, maybe starting in Genesis and going all the way through the Bible is not the best idea for you. One of the things I like doing, I like reading the Psalms and Proverbs together. I do this every year at some point. I'll do like five, five Psalms and one proverb, and at the end of one month, you'll get through all the Psalms and all the Proverbs. Mix it up. Be creative. You know, if you were going on a date with your wife and the only place that you ever went was the same exact restaurant and ate the same exact food and had the same exact conversation, probably have a very boring marriage, you know? So mix it up. Be creative. You know, read the, read the Bible backwards. You know, start in Revelation and read the other way. You know, maybe... You know, just try to get through the Gospels and try to read about Jesus and the life that he had. Uh, but mix it up and be creative. My second experience with the Bible was very different than my first. Praise God. I was, uh, my second experience with the Bible, I had, you know, my family, we didn't go to church, uh, as you might expect. Um, we weren't even Christer uh, type Christians. We didn't go on Christmas and Easter. Um, we went less than that. I probably went to church seven times by the time I was 15 years old. And every single time, somebody had invited me to church. And I think three of those times, I accepted Jesus because I was scared to death I was going to hell. Uh, but the problem was, um, I, never, I never had any way to follow through on it. Nobody brought me back to church. Nobody, you know, I didn't have a Bible. I would pray and then pray for like 30 days or something like that. And then eventually I was just like, well, how do you do this thing? The thing that changed my life was, one, when somebody discipled me. I gave my heart to the Lord when I was 15 years old, and somebody began to spend time with me. And the second thing was they, they gave me a Bible. There's a picture. This is the Bible that I got after I finished my discipleship uh, thing that I went through. It was like six weeks. It was really just an intro type thing. This Bible, I, I have a relationship with this Bible. I don't know if you have a Bible that you have a relationship with. I have a relationship with this Bible. And it changed my life. I, I got hungry. I read the Word. And it really, really changed my life. And I just want to encourage you guys today. One minute is all it takes. One minute. Open up and read one verse and see how God speaks to you in your life. So the psalmist... In 119, he says the thing that changes his life is that he wants to learn God's laws, his statutes, his decrees, not because he wanted to feel guilty for the rest of his life, but he actually believed as he connected with God through scripture, it would begin to change him more into the character that God desired for him. And I just want to attest, man, I believe that to be true 100%. I don't think it's a legalistic thing. I don't think that has to turn you into some type of uh, crazy Christian that's out to harm people rather than to help people. I think it is historically, biblically driven, mission-minded Christianity when we actually live out the things that the Bible teaches. And look, we can distort it and we can turn it into what we want to, but what if we actually lived our life according to God's word? Not because it was judgmental, but because it actually encouraged us to become a better person. Here's what we're going to do this morning. I'm so adamant about this. We only do this once a year. So you're lucky you're here this Sunday. 
This morning, if you are interested, you don't have a Bible of your own. First of all, you need to download the YouVersion app. It's completely free. They got a bazillion, literally a bazillion different Bible reading programs that are free on that app. You always have your phone with you. I know you do, even when you go into the bathroom, so you got time to read that Bible. It's on your phone. But if you're like me, and sometimes you just want to crack open a real Bible, and you would also have questions I find that many people who have given their life to Christ, they read the Bible, they have no idea what it's saying. We'll give you a variety of options. This morning, this Bible that's a $50 Bible, you can purchase it or reserve one by filling out a Connect card for $20. I mean, the, the price on the Bible is $50. We are supplementing that. You can so adamant. This is a, a study Bible, and it's of the version. There are lots of great versions of the Bible out there. We use kind of the middle-of-the-road one, the NIV, the non-inspired version. This so, is the one that changed it, my life, by the way. The it NIV. is? So, yes. Oh, yep, cool. That was my second Bible. Well, this is the newer one. It's better than the one you read, Rob. Watch it. But if, if you want this, uh, $20 today. Fill out a Connect card. We'll reserve a copy for you. It answers. It has a commentary at the bottom to answer a lot of the questions you might have because you don't understand the terms. We also, for those of you that are like, I don't want the Bible app on my phone, I'm not going to get the big heavy Bible, Um, I prefer this other particular study Bible, we will uh, count 50% off of whatever that Bible you find online that you want is, we will help get that for you 50% off. And then if you're like, Josh, you don't understand, I don't read I don't like the Bible app. I don't want your books. I don't read. Well, first of all, the Bible app, it will read it for you if you were that lazy. If you're like, that's not entertaining enough, we will help supplement for $20. I believe it's like a $70 product or something. For $20, you can get the Bible experience where Denzel Washington and other famous Hollywood actors will read the Bible for you. It's that easy. You can listen to it on the card on the right there. So fill out a Connect card today. And I just want to encourage you, wherever you are at spiritually, it's not some crazy weird thing. Like if we really want to encounter God more, we got to understand his ancient historic decrees. People lost their lives over protecting what this says so that you could hear it and learn from it today. I'm telling you, it's the only way I began to see God change my characters when I made an intentional time with him to hear from him in his word and allow him to change my life. I can tell the days I don't do it well. And I'm not saying that to make you or I feel guilty. It's just a reality. When we don't connect with him on a regular basis, it's far hard for him to change our character. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, uh, there are many of us in here today who we don't do this. We don't do this well. And rather than feeling guilty about it, God, I pray you just encourage us this morning. Give us hope that we actually can connect with you in scripture and make it a regular part of our life, not a legalistic part, a regular part we just look forward to connecting with you. And God, in those moments where we don't connect with you as we read it, God, may you encourage us to stick with it because we will. And so maybe you're here this morning right now and you've been a Christian for a while, but you've never made connecting with God through scripture a regular part of your life and you wanna do that this morning. I want you to pray this with me. Lord Jesus, I want to get to know you better. And I pray that you help me understand your word better, what your desire for my life is. And God, as crazy it is in our culture, that I would begin to base my life off of your word rather than contorting your word to according to the life I want to lead. God, we give you this morning. Thank you for your word that we can hear from you, that we can have this incredible life that Rob described. We surrender to you this morning. And I just got to imagine right now there is somebody in this room that you don't even have a relationship with Jesus. And I just want to tell you it's the best decision I ever made. And if you want to start that relationship, I invite you to pray with me right now. God, I want to know you. I want to live for you. And I surrender everything in my life to you. May you use me for decades to come. We pray this in your son Jesus' name. And all God's family said, amen. Amen.